I did want to start uh, by sending my sincere congratulations and the sincere congratulations of the TEC for what I thought was a magnificent uh, event and a magnificent turnout mm. uh, on November the 10th. Um, and I think it's appropriate that we do this because actually, of course, uh, cuts are a green issue. What you did was show very clearly that people, and particularly trade unionists, are willing to stand up and start saying no. And I think that was an incredibly important thing for this government to see. And it was an incredibly important moment for many people in other trade unions to recognise as possible. What I think is good today is that what we do is recognise that whilst we have got one hell of a job on our hands at the moment, and that could take all our energies, what we can do at the same time is, is say as a trade union that we have a much bigger and broader focus because our, our commitment to working people is something that has to extend to what we do in terms of campaigning around environmental issues because unless we deal with those fundamentals, our members, not only in their working lives but in their home lives, are going to face a very, very different world and it's not going to be in the long term. It's happening now, it's happening around us and it's happening in a way that I think employers particularly need to be dragged, kicking and screaming in some cases, to recognising where their responsibilities lie within that and that's something that trade unions have a responsibility and I think a real ability to do something about. What we are here today to do is to address what has been famously described as the single biggest challenge facing humankind and I have to say I have been very impressed by the work that UCU has done on this um, your support along with a number of other unions for the Climate Solidarity Project doing fantastic work, your uh, active engagement in the 1010 campaign about how can we reduce our carbon footprint, uh, innovations like environmental news, lots of important ways that you've been leading from the front on this agenda. This is the 35th anniversary of the Lucas workers alternative plan. The shop stewards combine meeting that first ever came up with the idea of we can do something different. Faced with massive technological changes, industrial changes, the threat of job losses, they came up with a whole host of products uh, that they believe Lucas should diversify into uh, from medical equipment, all sorts of buggies, all sorts of uh, fantastic ideas that were generated from the workforce, the full workforce, every level, not just the technicians, everybody was involved in generating those ideas. There was a spirit of creativity and practical solidarity because so many of those alternative workers' plans that we saw emerging at that time came out of a combination of shop stewards organised, in particular factories, and organisations collaborating crucially with sympathetic academics in universities and colleges up and down Britain. We're working very closely with the NUS as I suspect many of you are aware of. We're very pleased with that cooperation because again working with them, working with students can be one of the most vibrant and positive ways of bringing this agenda not only into our workplace but also then translating those policies out into the way that people once they've graduated take on views in, in, in their working lives from there on in. It has a very long term effect. It is critical I think that we do get uh, grassroots engagement in this agenda. You know, cutting carbon emissions can't be something that workers feel uh, is done to them. It's got to be something that we take control of, that we uh, lead on, and that we do with our members' interests in mind. And that means that we also need to start moving towards green agreements. We have in UCU tried very hard in the last year to start putting our policies into practice. We have now, we think, a, a, not, a, not a huge number of trained reps in terms of green issues, but certainly we are getting into the double figures and by next year I expect us to be in the hundreds because we have made that now one of the fundamentals of our training programme. We've done that 
because we know that unless we do that, we don't get the issues onto the bargaining agenda. If we don't get them onto the bargaining agenda, then we will not make progress and it will stay as policy rather than practice. So the people in this room, you, are very important to us in that. And I hope that what this will be is the start of a process that by even next Congress, next May, will be something that has doubled, trebled in number and something that we should be very proud of doing. We've got examples of joint green committees with management, massive savings being made on energy bills, uh, green travel to work, transport arrangements, uh, new ways of working flexibly. We've got green reps going around buildings, doing a green audit, looking at how we can make those savings. But call me an old-fashioned trade unionist. If we're making those savings, then I want workers to have a share of that green dividend, especially at a time when so many workers have faced up best modest pay increases and at worst, freezes and cuts in real pay. In the Stern report, the challenge of climate change was described as the biggest single case of market <coughs> failure ever seen. So we know that the market left to itself is not going to do the job. It needs active government intervention and it needs an active trade union movement and an active civic society uh, to determine how uh, market limits need to be placed on markets and indeed corporate behaviour in order that we achieve uh, the goals that we've set ourselves. It's also very important, I think, that we recognise what we're doing in that environment as being part of our international commitment. Because our international commitment is one where we're saying it is not okay for workers to be put in a position where the ability for an employer, the ability for governments to move capital, to move work, from one continent to another, from one country to another, based on how cheap and how poorly can they get away with treating workers in order to have the lowest price for their goods, is one that is having a huge and fundamental impact on the environment that we live in. Our global responsibility is therefore huge in that regard. We know that these extreme weather events <coughs> have more and more impact. We know that those in the global south who did least to cause this problem are suffering the worst consequences. And that's why in Copenhagen uh, and in Cancun, um, we will continue to fight to keep within the uh, draft treaty or whatever document finally emerges that crucial phrase about a right to a just transition because it's saying not only that we want jobs and livelihoods uh, to be at the heart of this, but that we as working people worldwide, we have a right to a say over our own destiny. We do not want to see a return to that Thatcherite industrial vandalism of the 1980s. This industry is going to go. We'll hope that jobs will somehow emerge somewhere else. And meanwhile, this group of workers and the community that depends on them is just uh, written off. We're not going to accept that. What we want is an intelligent industrial strategy where we manage that transition in a way that puts decent jobs, green jobs and decent skills at its heart. We can't achieve our aims and our objectives on our own. In all of the work we do now, we have to find partners that we can work with, partners that we can cooperate with, and partners who can enable us to grow in terms of the policies we have and also take on the values of the trade union movement in the work that they do. And I'm so pleased that you see yourselves as part of a much wider across the movement push to deliver a new green economy, but crucially, a fairer society. Thank you.